welcome back for the second part of this series. Without further ado, let's continue the story. The red-haired girl becomes very angry with Carnelian and charges at her to attack. However, Carnelian is ready to defend herself and fights back while the red-haired girl prepares to strike. Chen warns them to be careful and shows concern for Carnelian, who looks serious and confident. The red-haired girl tries to slash Carnelian with all her strength, but Carnelian easily avoids the attack by jumping high. Seeing an opening, Carnelian gets ready to strike back, making the red-haired girl even more nervous. With a powerful move, Carnelian cuts the girl in half with her strongest attack. Chen and everyone present witness the traumatic scene as the girl is sliced horizontally into pieces. Everyone is shocked by Carnelian's incredible power, amazed by her agility and ability to defeat a seal with one strike. They wonder what kind of creature she might be, with some even thinking she could be a seal herself. The crowd cheers and celebrates their victory over the devastated seal, calling her names like Julatin Seal or Chen Seal. However, Chen looks horrified and traumatized. He looks around and sees the dead bodies of soldiers and body parts scattered on the ground. He is on the verge of losing control, his hands covered in blood. Realizing that the blood on his hands is not his own but from the soldiers killed by the two girls and Carnelian, Chen drops to his knees and starts vomiting. He can't comprehend the gruesome events he has witnessed. Carnelian notices her master's distress and approaches him, asking if he is alright. Despite feeling sick, Chen manages to thank Carnelian for saving him. Carnelian's expression changes, and she looks down at him, clarifying that seals go berserk when they lose their owner. She questions what would happen if she were to become heartbroken. Chen bows down to her, expressing his gratitude, even amidst his ongoing vomiting. Carnelian sighs and remarks on what a pathetic owner she has, looking away and telling Chen that he can't even do a transfer right. The following day, the townspeople work together to clean up the aftermath, collecting the corpses of the soldiers and the prince. Chen and Carnelian observe the townspeople's efforts, with Carnelian looking neutral and Chen consumed by guilt. Suddenly, Stian appears and finds them, asking about their plans for the future. Both of them are confused by his question. Stian panics and proceeds to explain their situation. He asks what the feudal lord will do now that his son, his soldiers, and his seals have all been killed. Carnelian corrects him, stating that she only killed the seal and the lord's son, not the soldier. She continues talking that if it's just the local lord's army, she can take care of them in under a minute. Stian responds panicky, telling her that he is not asking how fast she can kill them, looks at him and sarcastically responds if he wants her to kill them slowly, telling Stian how much more cruel he is than she thought. Stian sighs and responds, telling her to think about it. Even if she massacres the entire lord's army, a stronger army with stronger seals will be sent after them. Sion talks about the army and warns her about the neighboring kingdom's army and even the imperial army that could come. However, after all the warnings Sion gives her, she just stares at him without any care or reaction. She then asks Sion about the small village lord's son, and Sion replies that the lord is still a noble. While the two are arguing, Chen steps up and shouts at Carnelian, telling her not to kill any people anymore. Carnelian looks calm yet surprised. Chen tells her that just because they are lowly and powerless doesn't mean that their lives have no meaning. No one deserves to die just because. Carnelian suddenly gestures toward the town and questions why Chen didn't voice his sentiments when the prince was still alive. She disagrees with Chen's viewpoint, asking the powerless and fragile owner what exactly he expects from him. Chen is left speechless by her words. As Carnelian and Chen argue, Stian ponders a plan. Suddenly, Chen responds that he will go and explain the situation, seeking forgiveness. Carnelian bursts into laughter at his response, mocking the notion of explanation, forgiveness, and expecting the Lord to pardon them. Both Chen and Stian are inclined to try the plan, and Stian volunteers to undertake it. Carnelian incredulously questions if they're under the influence or using drugs due to the absurdity of the plan. Stian explains that he can't help it and believes he can elucidate why the transfer failed and the fight ensued. He suggests he can try to explain it to the Lord, arguing it's better than Chen going. As the sun sets, the two weapons used by the girls, the wolverine claw and the two blades, come into view. Carnelian visits the seal and reflects on their past battles. The grief and sadness on her face hint at her aversion to fighting seals, possibly due to personal reasons. Meanwhile, Chen approaches her and she notices him, inquiring about the matter. He apologizes, hoping not to disturb her. Carnelian asks what he wants to discuss. Chen excitedly informs her that Stian has returned from the kingdom, surprising her, and shares that everything went smoothly. On their way home, she questions if Stian's head is still attached. Chen confirms it and reassures her everything is fine. 
Upon arriving home, Stian appears alive but serious, revealing that the Lord wants both of them to visit the kingdom and apologize. Chen cheerfully exclaims his readiness, but Carnelian, feeling skeptical, questions the sanity of a father who accepts an apology from his son's killers. Stian criticizes her pessimism, to which she retorts that it's because he hasn't witnessed humanity's worst for thousands of years, unlike her. Initially, Carnelian plans not to go, but Chen's pleading gaze melts her resolve, and she reluctantly agrees to help him just this once. Chen beams with gratitude as Carnelian sighs and acquiesces in the end. He agrees reluctantly, not because she wanted to, but because of the persuasive words of her owner. Meanwhile, at the Lord's castle, King Lancier Castillo sits on his throne when a servant informs him of Chen and Carnelian's departure. The feudal lord, visibly enraged, summons his champion named Jog. Jog promptly appears behind the king, ready to serve. The king instructs him to prepare a sharp blade for their distant guests, and orders him to flay them alive before executing them. Meanwhile, Chen and Carnelian have set out on their journey with their donkey. As the moon ascends, our heroes pause to rest and share a meal in the unfamiliar forest. Chen expresses surprise that Carnelian can endure without eating. Curious, Chen asks where she derives her strength from. Carnelian explains that she absorbs energy from her surroundings, akin to how plants undergo photosynthesis. However, Chen admits he's unfamiliar with photosynthesis and energy, prompting Carnelian to sigh in exasperation, suggesting he forget about it. Observing Chen eating jerky, Carnelian snatches a piece to consume, surprising him as he thought she didn't need to eat. She clarifies that while she doesn't starve, she can still eat, though she finds the jerky unappetizing. During their meal, Chen mentions Sion's remark about seals having long lifespans and serving multiple masters. He speculates whether Carnelian was a previous master and if there were legendary knights. Noticing Carnelian's expression, a blend of sadness and neutrality, Chen receives no response, and she diverts the conversation, expressing irritation and questioning if he's heard of privacy. Puzzled, Chen asks if privacy is akin to a magical spell. Carnelian elucidates that it's a spell safeguarding her personal matters, indicating she's under its effect and urges him to cease his inquiries and retire for the night. Both prepare for bed, but Chen appears confused by their earlier conversation. Despite this, they both retire for the night, though Carnelian wears a visibly saddened expression due to the question Chen posed. The following morning, they arrive at the Lord's Castle, where Chen is awestruck by its immense size, as it's his first encounter with such a grand structure. Both marvel at the castle's splendor, with even Carnelian finding it surprising that such magnificence befits a small village. A servant they encountered earlier approaches them humbly, informing them that their lord awaits their arrival. Noticing Carnelian's sword, the servant apologizes, stating that weapons are prohibited inside the castle. He offers to hold it temporarily. Carnelian refuses angrily, warning him that anyone who dares touch her sword will lose their hand. She challenges him on his certainty. The servant recoils in fear, but Chen steps in, asking Carnelian to entrust the sword to him. Reluctantly, she agrees, requesting him to apologize on her behalf. The servant nervously acquiesces and hurries into the castle, leaving Carnelian annoyed by the hassle. Upon his return, the servant informs them they may bring the sword inside. He invites them to enter. As they approach the throne, they're greeted by an intimidating assembly of guards surrounding the king. Approaching the lord, Chen bows and introduces himself as the cook from Kayoni village. The king acknowledges that he's heard of them, appearing calm. Chen offers a sincere apology to the king, expressing regret for the tragic events. The king bids Chen to rise, acknowledging the sorrowful incident, noting that the dead cannot be brought back. Inviting Chen closer, the king's demeanor prompts nervousness in Chen. Meanwhile, Carnelian eyes the king suspiciously, questioning his calmness despite his son's death. Standing and approaching Chen, the king recalls Sion's information about Chen's upbringing by the villagers after losing his parents. Chen confirms this, expressing gratitude to the villagers. Suddenly, the king's tone changes to one of anger, accusing Chen of endangering the village. He seizes Chen by the neck, shouting in fury and questioning if Chen believes he should repay them by sacrificing himself. Guards swiftly move to restrain Carnelian, creating a magic circle around her. Dark chains ensnare her body and her sword within the circle, causing her to struggle. Meanwhile, Chen grapples to free himself from the king's grip. The king reveals that Stian visited the castle and pleaded for the village's safety in exchange for his own life. He commends Stian's cunning, particularly for someone from a small village, wearing a smug and furious expression directed at our heroes. With escalating anger, the king berates Chen, branding him an idiot for placing trust in someone who betrayed him. He ominously declares that once the sealing process concludes, 
he will personally end their lives. While Carnelian continues to struggle and attempt to speak, finally breaking her silence, Carnelian confronts the king, remarking on the predictability of a small village lord's actions. The king scolds her for impudence and warns that once the ceiling is complete, he will ensure her demise. Remaining defiant, Carnelian pretends to struggle against her restraints, causing confusion among the onlookers. She asserts that they underestimate her power, and in a burst of energy, her sword emits blue lightning. Slamming the sword to the ground, she shatters the seal spell. The sudden release of energy sends those attempting to cast the spell flying, leaving them stunned. The king, astonished at her escape, grapples with how to handle her, as he is determined to eliminate any potential threats. The king retreats in fear, beckoning Carnelian to approach, realizing the consequence of his actions. She retorts that he should have anticipated such retaliation when his brutish son met his end. Panicked, the king attempts to flee, warning Carnelian that this isn't the end. However, Carnelian remains resolute, her expression grave as she hurls her sword at the king's champion, Jog, who cowers behind a wall. The sword strikes Jog with lethal force, impaling him through the chest and pinning him to the wall, leaving him lifeless. Carnelian then turns her gaze to the king, tauntingly questioning if Jog was his secret weapon, leaving the king trembling with fear and uncertainty. Without hesitation, Carnelian begins chanting a potent spell, her body enveloped in a radiant blue aura as she absorbs mana from her surroundings. The king, both awestruck and terrified, watches on, unsure of what is to come. Commanding the king to vanish, Carnelian unleashes a dazzling display of magic. A brilliant blue beam materializes outside the castle, akin to a scene from an action movie resembling a satellite-generated laser. As the beam widens, it envelops the castle, causing it to crumble and disappear from the map in a spectacular display of power. After the destruction of the castle due to Carnelian's power, Chen awakens, and Carnelian waits for him to regain consciousness. Confused, Chen looks around and inquires about the whereabouts of the Lord. Carnelian informs Chen that he's likely buried under the rubble, still unconscious. Chen is astonished to learn of the castle's destruction and stands up, questioning Carnelian if she knew what would happen from the start. Carnelian responds with a scornful expression, remarking that like father, like son, implying they both possess a destructive streak. She explains the potential consequences of such behavior if left unchecked. Chen listens quietly to her words, not uttering a single response. With a determined look, Carnelian instructs Chen to return home as they have one more task to attend to. Arriving at night, all the townspeople gather in the center of the town. Everyone is tense and speechless as Carnelian points her sword at Stian, while Chen remains uncertain. Maintaining her composure, Carnelian demands to hear Stian's final words. Stian defends his actions, claiming he had no choice but to save the village. However, Carnelian dismisses his excuse as cliché. Attempting to defuse the tension, Chen steps forward, asserting that Stian's intentions were to protect the village. However, Carnelian interrupts him, expressing her disgust at Stian's justification of having no choice to absolve his guilt. Chen listens silently to Carnelian's response but then speaks up, expressing concern about the lives she took and warning her against becoming no different than them and Stian. In response, Carnelian smiles wryly and chuckles, questioning the significance of being no different than humans. She elaborates on how she's been tainted by human hands for eons, expressing a willingness to embrace the flaws of humanity. Still holding her sword pointed at Stian, Carnelian is interrupted as Chen grasps her hand, expressing sadness at seeing her in such a state. He assures her it won't happen again and offers his help, surprising Carnelian. Touched by his sincerity, Chen pleads with her not to continue hurting herself, and Carnelian listens in silence, sighing softly in acknowledgement. Playfully annoyed, Carnelian assures him she won't kill them, teasing Chen about a master begging to a seal and feigning mock disgust. Meanwhile, Stian looks at Chen with a sense of guilt, thanking him for intervening. Chen acknowledges he hasn't forgotten Stian's actions but understands his intent to save the village. Stian's expression falls with remorse as he looks down. Carnelian suddenly implores Chen to promise to assist her and inquires about his plan of action. Chen assures her of his unwavering support. Carnelian decides their first destination will be the city, convinced they will find something of importance there. Feeling remorseful, Stian informs them that a departing merchant, who deals with Pester, will leave the next day and offers them a ride. Despite his offer to help with preparations for their journey, Carnelian, still harboring resentment, dismisses him as a show-off. Ignoring Stian's remarks, Carnelian and Chen walk away, leaving Stian to grapple with his regrets and guilt. As morning arrives, they are fully prepared and dressed for their journey. 
Carnelian compliments the small village's nice clothes and possessions. Observing Chen's large bag, Carnelian questions its necessity, to which Chen explains the need for humans to be prepared for various situations. Unlike seals, she responds with a sigh, teasingly reminding him he's not a knight on a quest to save the world. They await the carriage's arrival and request the driver to take them to a town with genuine knights, teasingly mocking Chen. The driver recalls a town named Bellissima, mentioning an upcoming royal duel scheduled to take place there in a week. Curious, Chen asks about the nature of a royal duel, prompting Carnelian to explain it involves participants fighting for the king's favor. The driver, taken aback, warns them to mind their words in the town. Dismissively, Carnelian mutters that it's merely some knights participating in a royal duel. The driver invites them into the carriage, suggesting that if they take a boat, they'll arrive in Bellissima before the duel. Continuing their journey, Chen asks Carnelian what's on her mind, noticing her troubled expression. Listening attentively, Carnelian, Chen shares his feelings about leaving his village suddenly, expressing surprise at the unexpected turn of events. Carnelian reassures him, suggesting he view it as a brief vacation. Once they resolve the transfer issue, he can return home. She smiles, anticipating their adventure. Arriving in Slake, they are greeted by a bustling dock filled with ships and boats. Carnelian marvels at the sight, while Chen explains the delay in the next boat's departure due to the royal duel's popularity. Carnelian jests about taking drastic measures to secure passage on the boat, but Chen earnestly urges her not to resort to such actions. In jest, Carnelian suggests commandeering the boat prompting Chen to caution her against drawing unnecessary attention to themselves. Overhearing townspeople discussing Lord Castillo's vanished castle, Chen grows anxious about the possibility of the truth being revealed. He advises Carnelian to avoid attracting attention, but she questions if there's a better approach. Suddenly, a mysterious man appears, offering them two available spots on a boat bound for Bellissima. Carnelian, suspicious of the offer, questions why their boat isn't full like the others. The man nervously suggests they decline if they're uncertain. Despite Carnelian's skepticism, Chen naively accepts the offer. The stranger introduces himself as Benny, a sailor on a smuggling ship. He explains that securing passage to Bellissima at this time of year is incredibly difficult. Chen expresses relief and gratitude for the opportunity provided by Benny, but Carnelian sighs, questioning whether Chen's kindness is genuine or simply naive. As Benny walks away, there's a subtle hint that he may have ulterior motives, suggesting potential danger lurking ahead. Concluding part two of this thrilling series, what will happen next? Will our heroes reach a city filled with formidable opponents? Is Benny truly a shady character? Lastly, will their adventure be met with an ambush, or will it proceed as a normal trip? Tune in next time for this manhwa, and I assure you, I will continue to deliver for you. Thank you for supporting our channel. As always, it's our destiny to discover new manhwa.